Good morning. It is the holy hour. I'd like to draw to your attention just a few announcements. Uh, Pastor Russell was in South Carolina with his family visiting his mom uh, before their one daughter heads off. Um, we have mission team Sarah and Mark are here and they'll be sharing more. Uh, please remember the, the family of Karen Reginelli. Her service will be this Wednesday. Um, I didn't look over what needs to be done. Before you know it, the mission trip is going to be here. Please keep them in your prayers. The 12 women of the Bible, Bible study started this last week. See my wife, Debbie, for information. Um, the end of summer barbecue bash is coming up. Mark your calendar on August the 20th. If you didn't pick up the blue copy of the prayer starters on the back is the birthdays and anniversaries. So, and I know some of you are having a birthday or an anniversary coming up, so we don't want to forget those. Let's see. I think that's the main things that I need to share. We, you can read them at your leisure. We invite you to join as we worship God and praise his name. Good morning. Please stand and sing with us. We will be singing um, verses one and four of America the Beautiful.
And so, Lord, here we are celebrating that you are the liberator. You're the great liberator. You're the great savior. You are the king of kings and you are the Lord of lords. And you came to rescue us from darkness. You came to rescue us from sin. You came to rescue us from Satan. You came to rescue us from ourselves and our own self-deceit. You, Jesus, are the Lord. You are the King of kings, and you are the Lord of lords. One day, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that you are the Lord to the glory of the Father. And so this day in which we celebrate our national liberation and freedom, we celebrate our spiritual freedom as well. Jesus, you are the great liberator. You are the great redeemer. You are the great savior. And so we worship you this morning. And even as we worship you, Jesus, we call out for your redemptive work in this world full of chaos and conflict and pain. We pray for the war in Ukraine. We pray for the conflicts and the emotional divisions in families and in our country. Jesus, you are the prince of peace and we ask through your church, through your people, that we might be salt and light, which displays your glory. Lord, we come to you in confidence and in faith because you've risen from the dead and you defeated the powers of darkness. We come with a prayer, Jesus, that you taught us to pray as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are the people of Jesus Christ who have been called by his spirit to follow him and to love one another. And we acknowledge that as we turn through the ritual of passing the peace and greet each other in Jesus' name. Let's do that now. this right good morning you know I noticed the in the prayer starters today is comfort for those who mourn so we want to comfort those who mourn who may be mourning today I want to give a shout out to my dad John F. Glazer, who died nine years, I don't know, I'm, he died nine years ago today. He was a great guy, so I just want to give a shout out. You guys, I am totally fine. I don't know why this happened. So, anyway, I've been thinking a lot about him this morning. Anyway, he loved July 4th, and so on that day, um, he just loved July 4th. So on that day, it rained so hard, they canceled it. So I just thought that was funny. <laughs> so our first reading today is Isaiah 41 uh, to 11. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. 
The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all the people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I say, what shall I cry? The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our Lord endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on the high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid and say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. This is the word of the Lord. Jane is introducing our minute for mission as the chair of the mission. Good morning. I'd like to introduce um, two of the missionaries that we support, Sarah and Mark Cavell. And Sarah grew up on, in our church. She has been with uh, Crew for 15 years, and Mark has been with Crew for 18 years and they will be speaking in detail in between services. So we invite all of you to stay after service and have a light brunch and listen to what they have to say. Okay. Thanks so much, Jane. Um, yeah, good morning. Um, for those of you who haven't met us before or haven't seen us in a long time, <laughs> Mark and Sarah Covell, this uh, picture of our kiddos as well. Um, Jared's eight, Hannah's seven, Emily's five. Um, I moved to Madeira when I was the age that Hannah, um, the one in blue, um, was in, a, in first grade um, and got to grow up here, um, was confirmed here in the church, um, was involved in the youth group, and then um, the Lord saw fit for me at Denison University to get involved in Campus Crusade for Christ, which is now known as Crew, um, and see my life transform a lot, by, especially by doing missions. So I went on a summer mission. Some of you even knew me and supported me and things. Um, in Rome, Italy, my first summer after uh, my, first, my first summer of college, um, and then ended up joining staff. Um, and so many of you have been with us, um, and the church has been um, a part of supporting my ministry as um, I served in Rome, Italy, and then Indianapolis, um, then moved to Chicago, married this guy. Uh, we started, um, I switched over to doing uh, ministry with South Asian American college students um, with the Ministry of Design Movement. Um, and then we had we served in Chicago there for several years, about four or five together. Uh, then we moved to South Asia for two years, and then when we moved back to the States, we ended up in Ypsilanti, Michigan, um, which is where we've been the last five years. So you can mark how long we were there because Emily was born as soon as we got there. <laughs> um, and actually, the Lord has it um, in his uh, plan for us to transition uh, which Mark will share a little bit more, but um, to transition to Orlando, Florida to work at the crew headquarters this next year. So I'll actually be doing a finance role in the office um, and getting to invest in the worldwide ministry of crew as we seek to um, help uh, students, but also people um, who aren't college students as well um, to do evangelism and discipleship and to, um, to spread knowledge about Christ and help people to grow um, in considering Christ. Good morning. This last year, we've had the opportunity to continue serving and coming alongside South Asian American college students. And one of the goals that we've had is to seek to transition leadership from us to them. And I'm excited to say that that's happening. One of the, our former students who then joined on as an intern has now joined on as full-time staff. She's standing there on Sarah's left, and um, I'm right in front of her, uh, behind her. And her name is Michelle, and so she's joining as full-time staff and will be taking the role of the team leader for the Southeast Michigan Design Staff Team. Um, as we're transitioning, 
um, makes a natural place for her and our leadership have invited her to serve in that capacity. So it's so exciting, someone who's been raised up through the ministry and is South Asian American herself will be leading the team and helping lead um, overall with the other team leaders in other cities. Uh, so we're really excited for that, that's a big blessing. Um, so thank you for being part of actually making that happen. Yeah, thank you so much. And we'd love to meet and talk to any of you after the service. Um, so thank you so much. You know, I, I met the Lord when I was 18 after my first year of college. And uh, I used to lay in bed awake at night in those early weeks after my conversion, terrified that God was gonna call me to be a missionary. <laughs> which was the last thing at that point I wanted to do. And then over the years as I met the Lord and I discovered the thrill it was, what a privilege it is for the little taste we've had of missions, but it's wonderful in the adventure of following the Lord and he calls us to various places and across cultures. Proclaim the good news as Jesus called us into all the nations to proclaim the good news that he is Lord. So we honor your journey and are grateful for your faithfulness to him. Well, we are engaged in mission and we fund that by giving to the Lord and giving to each other. And so we make an offering to the Lord in each service to give our hearts to the Lord, but also to share of our finances. And the Lord uses that for his purposes here in Cincinnati and through supporting people and around the world. So let's now bring the Lord the gift of our tithes and offerings.
next reading is by John 1, 19 to 42. If you guys haven't bought that little book of John, you really have to buy one. It's $4. And if you have always like, oh, maybe I should read part of the Bible or maybe I should just read, you know, I kind of want to, but I just never do. Just start with the book of John and that little book. It's, it's really, really good. Now, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confess freely. I am not the Messiah. They asked him, well, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way of the, for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor a prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher. Where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon's, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You, we, you will be called Cephas, which then translated is Peter. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. This passage is that um, Russell has chosen as we go through John is full of all kinds of things and probably make three or four sermons. Uh, so we're kind of Narrowing it down, I guess. I read a book. John or Robert Fulgram is the author of several books, including All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. And it was already on fire when I laid down on it. His books are full of adventures and antidotes, not unlike a book that Dr. Robert T. Sharp wrote a veterinarian and member of the Hillsborough Church that I served for 25 years. In fact, he chaired the committee that brought me there. His book recounts scenes of country veterinarians entitled, Do Dog, No Dogs in Heaven? Question mark. Scenes from the life of a country veterinarian. Years ago, some of his antidotes appeared in the Country Living magazine. If you like to chuckle, especially if you're familiar with the country scene, I highly recommend it. But then, back to Robert Fulgram in his book, Uh-Oh, 
He tells about a neighbor of his who who drives a brand new Range Rover, a vehicle that Fulgram says can outrun a lion and take a rhino head on. One Tuesday morning, Bigram left his house with the, at the same time as his neighbor. The neighbor was carrying a golf bag, a gym bag, a raincoat, an umbrella, a coffee cup, a sack of garbage for the dumpster, and his briefcase. He was in a hurry. Two little pieces of toilet paper stuck to his chin from a hasty encounter with his razor, and a knitted brow testified to a hasty encounter with his wife. But he is carrying the symbol of his success, his briefcase, solid brass hardware with his name embossed in gold. The prestigious briefcase probably weighed 10 pounds. A neighbor lady, two doors down, a social worker from the Episcopal Church, pulled out of her driveway about the same time as the businessman, Ann Fulgram. The businessman cranked his engine like he was at the pole position for the Indy 500. Uh-oh, he has put his coffee cup and his briefcase on top of the car, and there it remains as he drives away. The neighbor is right behind him, and her eight-year-old, he called just get me there and back, God, Ford sedan. Fulgram is behind her in his 1952 GMC two-ton go-ahead-and-hit-me panel truck. The lady begins to honk her horn at the Range, Range Rover, which the man ignores because he's already on his cell phone. She keeps honking. He finally hears her throws down the phone, leans out the window, and makes an obscene gesture at her. She continues to honk while waving for him to stop. Fulgrim then hits his horn that he salvaged from an old Model T, and it goes, ooga! The man jams on his brakes, flings open the door, and tries to get out without unlatching his seatbelt. At the same time, his morning cup of coffee slides off the roof, bounces a across the hood and smashes on the street. This is followed by his briefcase, which crashes onto the hood, scrapes paint as it crashes to the ground. The dear lady coasts slowly around the scene of the accident, waves and smiles and sings out, have a nice day to her neighbor, still dangling from the car in the clutches of his seatbelt. Let me quote Fulgram, and no, she did not, as you might anticipate, run over his briefcase. No, she did not, he says. I did. Fulgram reports the man is a little distant these days, but his wife smiles and waves. Fulgram writes, he's not a bad guy. Like me, he takes on more than he can handle sometimes. Like me, he gets confused about what's important. I see myself in his mirror. It's less embarrassing to talk about how he runs his life than to talk about the cartoon quality of my own. Fulgram closes the story with these words. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? The question, according then to John, is what are you testifying to? What is your priorities? Where do you set and what is most important? Today, we look at the encounter of Jesus with John the Baptist. We need to understand that John the Baptist, son of Zechariah and his Elizabeth, had a real impact on the people around the area of Jerusalem. The uptight, successful businessman in Fulgram's story seems a world away from the figure of John the Baptist preaching out in the wilderness. It's easy to make fun of poor old John, he didn't carry a briefcase or drive a SUV. John was somewhat eccentric, to be sure, dressed in clothes made of camel's hair and girded with a leather, leather belt, surviving in the wilderness on a diet of locusts and honey, and devoting himself to warning his generation of the judgment that was yet to come. And he would have put any fundamentalist preacher to shame with his uncompromising call to repentance. 
But undoubtedly, that was part of his appeal. He was so completely different from the temple priests in Jerusalem who dressed in fine linen. So his call for a different way of living carried a great amount of appeal, especially for those for whom life was a struggle. We need to remember, though, that John was a surprising success in his ministry. According to biblical scholar Rodney L. Cooper, it's estimated that as many as 300,000 people came out to be baptized by John. People, people were willing to travel from Jerusalem to hear his dark and gloomy preaching. People were obviously hungry for a new word from God, even if it was crudely presented. Yet when John saw Jesus coming toward him, he knew that here was the one that people really should be listening to. This was confirmed when he, he baptized Jesus and saw the Spirit come down like a dove to rest on Jesus. John knew that people needed what he had to give, but he also knew that in Jesus they could find everything that they would ever need. John's role then was to point people to Jesus. According to John's gospel, when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him to be baptized, he uttered some remarkable words. Behold the, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Every time John the Baptist points people to Jesus, he referred to Jesus as the Lamb of God. He identified Jesus as the embodiment of the good news and what good news it was, and yes, still is. Such a proclamation, even before Jesus had begun his ministry, is unique to the Gospel of John. Jesus, at this, at this point, had performed no miracles, nor called any disciples. That was toward the end of today's reading. He was still fresh from the carpenter shop, he had made no enemies, proclaimed no controversial teachings, not ruffled any royal feathers even. Any comparison to the Passover lamb sacrificed for the sins of the people was certainly premature. It would be some time before Jesus would be warning his disciples that he would suffer and die. Yet, here we find an allusion to that event in the very first chapter of John's Gospel. Most of us are aware that the writer for, of John, the Gospel of John, in contrast to the writers of the Synoptic Gospels, the other three earlier that are called that because they report almost all the same events, was that is not so much interested in writing history as he was in writing theology. He wanted his readers and us to know that only that Jesus came into the world, but also what that great fact meant for us and still means today. John was kind of like the Monday morning quarterback who filled in the details as he reported the good news. He used a powerful imagery in his first chapter of the gospel. The word became flesh and the light shines in darkness. But no image carries a greater impact than this one, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Notice that John says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He does not say the sins of Israel or the church or the sins of Americans, but the sins of the world. There is enough saving power in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ with the entire world, if only the world knew, if only your next door neighbor knew. Most people reduce their religion to a set of thou shall nots. Subsequently, many people experience and often understand religion to be a heavy burden that enslaves and fatigues rather than frees and empowers. The world needs to know. Our friends and neighbors need to know that they have won something far greater than the 
the state lottery. They need to know that their name has already been selected to receive a greater gift than ever awarded to anyone, an eternal victory over sin and death. All they have to do is claim their gift. An eternal relationship with the loving God through Christ is theirs and ours simply for the asking. So what does all this say about our lives? We are those who are called to tell the story. We are called to point others to Christ, just as John the Baptist did. Following in the footsteps of our Lord, we are not sent out to condemn the world, as John tells us in chapter 3, verse 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. John tells us that we must tell the same saving message of great love that was poured out on a tree on Calvary. We are those who are called to help others to look beyond their overwhelming problems to the one who is big enough to overcome every problem. We're to finish the work begun by our Lord about 2,000 years ago, the work of reconciling the world with God. It's reported that Leonardo da Vinci had started to work on cam a canvas in his studio. He chose a subject, sketched the outer lines, shaded and lightened some. About halfway through the work, he, however, he stopped sketching. He turned to a student of his and said, I want you to finish the work that I've begun. The student protested. He surely was not worthy of such an honor. Da Vinci reassured him, will not my example inspire you to do your best, he said. And besides, I'm right here beside you if you need any help. That's Christ's message for us. We're not alone. The risen Lord is with us. One problem in our society is that re we really don't need anything. Many of us have everything we really need, so we don't feel a need for God to provide or protect us. But there will come a time when we need God's provision. In fact, the only thing that we will possess in that time is our relationship with God. Because ultimately, our life is measured according to Christ's life. Do we love like he loved? Can we forgive like he forgave? Are we willing to serve as he served us? Someone has said that in creation, God showed his hand, but on Calvary, he gave his heart. John the Baptist was having a dramatic, effective ministry. But then he saw Jesus coming toward him. John was a success. But that wasn't the most important thing at the moment. Here was the one who was bringing light and life to the world. To make Jesus known became John's most urgent task, just as it is ours. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, says John, and we need to do that. We need to look beyond our present difficulties to the one who can deliver us. We need to behold the majest majesty of Christ. We need to respond to the ministry he's called you and me to complete. John chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, and then 19 to 28, reminds us that we are not the light, but with John, we are called to testify and witness to the light, who is Jesus Christ. To bear witness occurs 33 times in the fourth gospel. How can you bear witness to the true light who has come into our world? May his example inspire us and his presence empower us to serve as Sarah and Mark are doing right now until the world knows that the victory over sin has been won. Let us strive to the witness as John did.
In Jesus' name, amen. Will you pray with me? Eternal and gracious God, as we gather, we pause and just thank you that John pointed to our Savior as an example that we ought to point as well. And so, Lord, if we gather and give you thanks for that precious gift of knowing that Christ is here for us, we pray in his name. Amen. As we prepare to receive our Lord's Supper, I would invite you to stand and recite the Apostles' Creed with me, the summary of our faith. Let us stand. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered unto Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. <coughs> the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I would invite the elders who are assisting and serving to come forward at this time. And so we are reminded that on that night when Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples, he took bread and after giving thanks, broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant sealed with my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. The gifts of God for the people of God come together to receive, partake, give thanks. I like to do a little bit of things different in my church. You'll be coming forward to receive. I would ask that as you receive and are seated back in your seat that you partake of the bread, symbolizing our unity or our personal relationship with our Lord and Savior. But I would ask that if, then you would hold the cup until all are served that we may partake of the juice together symbolizing our unity in the one body of Christ. So come forward to receive to give thanks. <laughs>
Christ, the cup of our salvation, Jesus said, take, drink, and remember. been fed, go out into the world, sharing the good news of the gospel with those that you meet. And now may the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, go with you both now and forevermore. Amen and amen.